Hello. Welcome to our webinar on how to write a scientific manuscript. The Journal of the International Aid Society, along with Educational Fund, have organized this webinar with the aim of providing you with an overview on how to write a good manuscript and what are the important elements that are part of it. There will be upcoming webinars organized by IAS as well in the fall in English, Spanish and French. And members of International Aid Society will receive the invitations and will, will be grateful if you spread the word among your colleagues, especially the ones that missed it today. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate it if you could spend two minutes to fill the survey that will come up when you leave the webinar. This survey is really important for us. We want to know who is most interested in this webinar and how we can improve it for the next time. My name is Elisa de Castro Alvarez. I'm an editor at the Journal of the International Aid Society. At GIS, our mission and vision is to provide a platform for the dissemination of HIV research freely available, to encourage submissions from low and middle income countries, and where we are aiming to do today, provide a capacity building opportunity, capacity building opportunities for less experienced authors. Our journal is peer reviewed, meaning that all, all our articles are sent to peer reviewers for assessment. We publish our articles online and we are open access, meaning that all our articles are freely available. And uh, this is a requirement made by donors more and more often that will support a study when we publish open access. So this is a very important feature. We are indexed in PubMed and other repositories, and our impact factor just came up is 5.19. We are a multidisciplinary journal, meaning that we publish HIV research articles in all disciplines, from basic science, clinical science, to social science or epidemiology. And as I said before, we provide workshops and webinars to provide capacity building opportunities, usually linked to IAS conferences. So today we will discuss how to write a research manuscript. We will talk about choosing a journal and submitting a manuscript. We will talk about editorial decision making and which are the most common reasons for rejection. How to respond to reviewers and how to revise your manuscript and we will shortly discuss as well about publication ethics. At the end of the webinar, there will be room for questions and answers that you can already write in the tab that you have in Zoom for Q&A. Since you are many today, we will be unable to respond to all questions, but we will try to choose the ones that are most popular and respond to a few at the end. So please remember that publishing advances both scientists and science. From a scientific point of view, the results that are not published mean that the research did not take place. Let's get started with how to write a research manuscript. What do you think that makes a good manuscript? For us, it's all about the question. We believe that a good scientific question is important for a good research study and a good manuscript as well. Your research is based on a question that you wanted to explore. In the same way, your manuscript will revolve around this question. You will first give the reader some background information so it becomes clear that your work answers a question that has not been answered. You will then explain how you design your study in order to answer this important question. You will then present your data collected and analyze them. And then you will compare them to the existing literature and underscore how what you found has increased our understanding in order to answer the research question. At the end, you will conclude with the key information that has been learned. So, the chain of research process is long. It always starts with a puzzle. There are pieces missing or, need, or they are needed to put together. So 
the researcher must do first a very careful literature review to be aware of all that is published in that topic. Then you will come up with a research question and you will design your project in order to respond to that. Then a tricky part comes. You need to look for funding and ethical approval. And once you have those, you can start the collection of your data. Then you will analyze them, interpret them. And once you have gone through the data interpretation, you will start thinking about writing your manuscript. Once it's written, you will submit it to a journal. You will respond to the reviewers. And after revision, your manuscript will be published. The structure of your manuscript depends on what type of article you are writing. It can be different from a debate, a review, or a research article. Here we are only looking at research manuscripts today. Each journal also has its own instructions on how to structure your manuscript. So it is worth, for many reasons, deciding to which journal you're going to submit your manuscript before starting to write. The structure of a manuscript may also depend on the discipline, which can differ between social science or clinical science, for example. So here we are highlighting the basic general structure that is quite well accepted in biomedical sciences. It is called IMRAD, which stands for Introduction, Methods, Results, and Discussion. However, as you can see, the manuscript has many other elements besides these four core sections that are also important. We will go through each section during the webinar, even if this is not the actual order you may write your manuscript in. We will discuss that later on as well. So before you start to write, you need to have an overview of your manuscript. And the best is to do this by answering the following questions in short sentences. So order your thoughts and make your motivation clear. Have I done something new and interesting? What problems did my study address? How did my study address those problems? What are the key findings? What are the implications for research, for practice and policy of my findings? So you should be able to clearly respond to the questions here, otherwise you risk not being clear in your manuscript either. Once you have done this, many people start with the methods section, as this is often the easiest section to write. You know how you conducted your study, and there are often conventional phrasings to describe this. Then the authors usually go over the results section, decide on which information should be displayed in figures or tables, and then you would write your introduction and finally the discussion because this is the most difficult part. We will go through it later as well. The abstract and the title depend on the author's preference. Some start with a preliminary version and then finalize it once the manuscript is ready. So what do you think is the most important part of a manuscript? No doubt, the title. Why? Because most of people will only read your title. The title discloses basic information and helps the readers decide if they will read the full paper or not. So it needs to be short, specific, informative, and representative of your research. You as a reader, think about how would you get interested in a title, thinking that your time is precious and it might take 20 minutes to read a manuscript. So keep in mind that your title is your mini advertisement. It also should contain keywords for search engines so that readers will find your article in relevant, in relevant research um, databases. So think about how would I search for this piece of information? And then you design the title. Sometimes titles already summarize the main findings or conclusion. 
although there is no rule against this, we recommend to be careful with declaratory titles because it's very hard to do justice and be representative of your findings in just 15 words without context. So let's look together at an example. Is this a good title? Let's try to find the different types of information that this title contain. Young people who inject drugs in India have high HIV incidence and behavioral risk. Cross-sectional study. This is uh, the title of an article published in uh, our journal this year. So the title responds to four key questions. The who, the where, how, and what. So who are the targets of the study? Young people who inject drugs. Where was the study run in India? And what is the topic? High HIV incidence and behavioral risk. And then how did the authors address this topic? It's a cross-sectional study. So these four questions might be, might, must be responded, sorry, always in a good title. And as we said before, you don't really need to give away your results. The abstract is the most, the next section, let's say, that is most often read after the title, because most of the times it is also freely accessible as well if the journal is not fully open access. So the abstract includes all the important details and data from your research study. So it's a brief summary of your manuscript and it can serve as a standalone summary of the work. There is usually a word limit for the abstract and to know that you have again to check the guidelines of the journal. It's between 150 and 350 words. And you will also find in the journal the structure of the abstract. In this case for research manuscripts it's usually introduction, methods, results and conclusion. So in the introduction you will describe the issue, the knowledge gap and the aim of your study. In the method section, you will describe the methodology. What was the approach? How was the, the approach taken? Then in the results section, you will describe your findings. And in the conclusions, the main outcomes and implications of your results. The abstract doesn't have any figures or tables. It's only text. There are also no references and no acronyms unless it is used more than three times. If you have a clinical trial registration number, it should go in the last line of the abstract. So don't go beyond what is established in your paper and don't offer results that are not significant because in the abstract there is no room for speculation. The main problems we usually encounter in the abstracts we read are that these are inconsistent with the manuscript information or incomplete. So let's look together at an example. This is an abstract of a manuscript accepted in GIS. Let's look here at some of the important elements that should be mentioned in your abstract. We are, we are showing here one paragraph, I mean two paragraphs, the introduction and the method section. In the next slide, I will show the results and the conclusions. So for the introduction, we need to include first the topic. In this example, the topic is maternal mortality. Then the authors mention the knowledge gap, what needs to be addressed in this field. In this case, South Africa experienced a reversal of gains in decreasing maternal mortality with an increase in HIV-related maternal deaths. And then what is the specific aim of this study? They assess trends in maternal mortality in HIV infected women. These three elements should always be in the introduction section of your abstract. Then in the methods, the authors mention the type of study, the settings, and very importantly, the time frame. It's very important to know when the study was done because if it was done 20 years ago, it might not be relevant anymore. In the results section, we present the findings. The authors here 
clearly list their main results. In this case, they have numbers, but it could be a social science study with the results of a survey, for example. So it depends on the discipline of the paper and the results will be shown in a, in a different way. This is something we will go through when we talk about the main text results section. And then in the conclusions, the author summarized the findings without repeating the results in detail. So as you see, the abstract is a standalone piece of information. Remember that many people will only read your abstract and may not have access or time to read your full article. Now we are gonna go through the different sections in the main text. And we are gonna start with the introduction. It's similar to the abstract introduction, but it is an extended version of it. So you need to respond to the same questions. The background, what is the topic? The context, what do we know about this topic? What has been previously published? And then the challenge, what is the nature and importance of the knowledge gap? And finally, the specific aim of your study. So as you see, the introduction has a final shape from general to specific. We have an example of an introduction of a manuscript published by GIS this year by two young colleagues. Let's read it together and try to identify the core elements we discussed in the previous slide, the background, the context, the challenge, and the aim. The background in this paper is TB as a leading cause of morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV. Next, and think about the final shape, what is the context? What is already known about this? The use of ART reduces the risk of HIV-associated TB by up to 67%. However, this reduction is time-dependent. After the context, the challenge, what question has been unanswered? What are we willing to cover? In Malawi, the proportion of co-infected TB HIV patients registering for TB treatment while on ART increased from 52% to 92% recently. And the reasons for this dramatic shift are unclear. So next, is the aim of the study. In this case, the authors mention three different aims. It's usually, I mean, it's more common to have only one, but it's good to see in this example that they have been very clear mentioning the three aims of this specific study. I would like to note that here, I think somewhere we had HIV infected patients we will talk about terminology later on, because we believe that in the HIV field, using the right terminology is very important. And we would ask the authors to write HIV positive patients or people living with HIV instead. We will talk about that later. After the introduction, we find the method section. So how did you study your question? Is the study reproducible? The methodology validates your study. You can use subheadings to organize this section if needed. You can have the study settings, the analysis, the modeling, etc., depending on the methodology used. This is where you give away the details on ethical approval and patient consent. And the difficult part of writing the methods is that they need to be detailed enough to allow replication and relevant, but not too long. You have to find the balance between giving away enough information but don't extend it too much. In any case, it is good to be ready to provide more information about the methodology when you respond to the reviewers. In any case, you should include procedures, materials used, data collected, data analysis, and statistical, statistical methods. We recommend to use past tense, and it's important to remember not to include your results yet. That will go in the results section. 
which are the important parts of the methods section. The questions the methods would respond, and these are key elements that also need to be always there, are who, how, where, what, and when. Who was the subject of the study or who was targeted by the program? It could be mice, it could be humans, a specific population or specific age or gender. Then how was the study designed? Is it a retrospective longitudinal prospective study? It is a survey. What is the outcome of interest measured? And what was the data collected and analyzed? You also need to add the settings, as we were saying for the abstract, um, the, for the method section of the abstract. So where did the study take place? Or where was the project implemented? Then what was measured? What are the factors of interest? And finally, when? And the time frame again is very important because it will make the study relevant if it's recent enough. So remember that you also have to, you, you always have to buy the, to find the balance between giving sufficient details, but keep in mind the word limit of the manuscript. Now let's look at the results section. Here you should provide the findings of your study. What is the best way to present your data? Sometimes you have data that are better understood in tables or figures or text. You should avoid repetition, be specific. We also recommend to use past tense and keep a logical flow in your writing. You should present only the results that are relevant to your question and you don't need to report all the results if they are in tables and figures. Here you will draw the reader's attention to the most important results. Remember that this is not the section to include any methods and also you don't have to discuss your results yet. <clears throat> Importantly, try to be precise. We noted here that you should be careful with words that are vague, like some, many, or few. <coughs> Sorry. You should also avoid the word significant if something has not, if something is not statistically significant. Very importantly, sex and gender should be integrated into research design into methods and analysis. The disaggregation is critical to benefit men and women. JIS actually has a gender editorial policy to support gender considerations in science. We believe that not knowing about sex differences may lead to less evidence-based medical practice. If results for male and female participants are not analyzed separately, Aggregate results may mask important clinical differences, toxicity or adverse effects. So we encourage you to check the SAGAR guidelines to better know how to disaggregate and analyze your data in this regard. And remember that this is everybody's responsibility. Researchers, funders, ethics boards, journal editors, and also reviewers. When you're planning your figures and tables, remember that people like pictures. Use figures when they are helpful to transfer information. They should be understandable without text. The figures must add to the text and they have to be something that cannot be clearly and concisely written in the narrative. And it is up to you to decide which figure or table works best for your data. When you design your figures, remember to be careful with the colors because they will be black and white printing and color blindness. 
remember to label all the axes, columns and rows and be very detailed with the legends since the figure needs to stand alone. Remember that sometimes people will only look at the figures and not read the text. As we said, writing the discussion is the most difficult part. You have to order your thoughts. You should respond to the following questions. Did the results answer my question? How do the results compare to other studies in other countries? What were the specific challenges and what can be done to improve this system, or this model? Could my findings be replicated elsewhere in similar settings? Are they generalizable or of local interest? And then what are the implications of the findings for policy, for practice and research? So in the discussion, you need to present your results and their impact in light of what has been already published. You do not repeat your results, but you can summarize them in the first paragraph of the discussion. And the discussion should be based on the results. You will place your findings into context using key references, but you shouldn't go beyond the study scope. This is the section where some speculation is acceptable. In the last paragraph before the conclusion, you should describe the limitations. And remember that all studies have their limitations. We also recommend that you discuss how did these weaknesses affect your data? And if applicable, how did you address them? You can also mention the strengths of the study. So please remember to avoid in the discussion, as we noted here, Statesman, statements that are not supported by the data. Let's find in this example the places where the authors have placed their results into context. This is an article published by GIS last year by Palma and colleagues. And here we, we are going to find in the first paragraph a brief summary of the findings. You see that the authors start by, in this study, we found that. So they won't repeat the results, literally, but they make a brief summary of it. In the second, they put the results into context. Observation, our observations of, were consistent with, and they named the references. Then in contrast, and they named the ones that had different results. And finally, they say our study is the first to be careful with this statement, since you have to be sure that it's really the first study to address that topic. And in the, in the last paragraph of the discussion, the authors describe the strengths and the limitations of the study. The conclusions is the last section of your article. Here, you will give away the key take-home messages. Here, you can be more general and explain wider implications of your findings. You give away your recommendations for other research or implementation programs. You should avoid obvious statements, repetition of results, and overgeneralizations. These are the conclusions of the same paper we saw as an example for the introduction to a young colleagues. As you see, they start saying overall and then TB incidence declined among those on ART. And this suggests that. So this is the take home message. And it can be a little bit more general than when they were describing their findings. They also give wider implications of the findings. And finally, they give a recommendation. So ART drug substitution and provision of IPT could merit inclusion in comprehensive TB and HIV programs.
So which section do you think contains the most errors? A lot of people get surprised. These are the references. The references are very important. If you just provide data of others without referring to them, that's plagiarism. And this is a reason for rejection. Journals have an automatic screening process to detect plagiarism, and this is screened before doing the pre-assessment of the manuscript. Secondly, don't forget to look at the format of the references that is required for the journal where you're going to submit your manuscript, because the requirements for references are very often different from one journal to another. But it will always be clearly described in the author guidelines. Remember that the references give credibility to your study. They show knowledge and awareness of the field, and they validate your claims and arguments. We recommend to avoid citation bias because that is also unethical. And of course, we recommend that you read your sources. Other sections included at the end of the manuscript are the acknowledgements and funding. Since you're responsible for getting written permission for people mentioned here, comply your funders regulation about acknowledging their support. Then the author's contribution. The author's contribution statements are now usually asked by the journals and often published with the article. This is to ensure that authors listed fulfill the authorship criteria of the journal and that persons are named who can take responsibility for certain parts of the study. So you have to clearly mention who has done what. Regarding the conflicts of interest, it is very important to declare all conflicts of interest, financial, professional, personal, even those are only potential conflicts of interest. You should show transparency in your statements. We recommend that you use the right terminology that is accepted in the HIV field. For example, we recommend to use people living with HIV or affected by HIV instead of infected with HIV. Instead of patients, in, I mean, of, of course, as, as we mentioned in the slide, except for the context of a clinical setting, we prefer to use clients or clients instead of prostitution, sex work, instead of AIDS, orphans, orphans and vulnerable children affected by HIV. And here we listed other examples, like instead of risk, most at risk or high risk people, most vulnerable to HIV acquisition. To check the terminology that is uh, better accepted in the HIV field, you can refer to different sources. We listed some of them here. UNAIDS has a very uh, comprehensive editorial style guide and a terminology guide. The CDC offers also an easy to use guide on non-stigmatizing language. So please check these sources for HIV terminology that might not be familiar to you. So how to choose a journal and submit a manuscript? What influences your choice of journal? There are several factors that could influence your choice. And it's very important to submit to the right journal since choosing the, choosing the, the wrong journal will result in rejection, which can be frustrating. Here we have some criteria that could be considered while choosing a journal. The coverage by indexing, the journal is open access, this is also a very important thing to, to take into account. The article, if the journal is open access, will be freely available to all. And this could be a request from your donor or your funder that because some of them require open access publication of the studies that they have supported. Then the cost, of course, of the publication, the journal's prestige or impact factor, also, the speed of editorial decision might be important for you. And finally, and very important for all the readership, 
You have to find the right journal for your research and your findings. Think about which journals you and your colleagues read. And those are probably the journals which the audience you want to target. So what to do and not to do in a manuscript submission? We would mainly say carefully follow the instructions. Where can you find the instructions? They are always very clearly described in the journal website. You should examine also a recent issue of the journal. And it's always good to have a copy of a similar article to yours from the journal you want to submit at hand when you're writing. There are also some general guidelines like uniform requirements for manuscripts to biomedical journals from the ICMJE or the Equator Network, but also provides a number of guidelines um, for different aspects like, for example, consort for the reporting of trials. Then in our experience, the most often ignored instructions are the following, the word count. It's very important to respect the word count limit. And this is always mentioned in the author guidelines of the journal. The reference formats, as we were saying before, vary between journals. And this is something important to check before writing. The tables and figures. Some journals require the tables and figures to be submitted in separate files or at the end of the manuscript. It is important to do it the right way and also provide the tables and figures of the highest quality you can provide. And the abbreviations. We find very often that the authors fail to write out the first time they are written in the manuscript. So finally, the cover letter. The cover letter can be very useful. Most journals expect a cover letter to be submitted, addressed to the editors when submitted the manuscript. As with the abstract, you should ensure that the content reflects the content of the manuscript. You can highlight any special circumstances here, and you can explain why the journal is a good fit for your particular manuscript. You can also suggest reviewers, who should be persons, by the way, you have not collaborated or published with in the last five years at least, and don't belong to the same organization or institution as the authors. You can also suggest excluding persons from peer review. I mean, realistically, not more than one or two, but there might be people that you think you may not receive a fair judgment, and you can carefully and justify this to the editor in the cover letter. So how do the editors make their decisions and which are the common reasons for rejection? Most journals do a pre-assessment of the manuscripts before deciding to send them to peer review or not. Like this, we avoid wasting time for everyone if the manuscript does not meet the standards of the journal. Some items that editors may look at are listed on the slide. Does the manuscript fit with the scope of the journal? Is the objective of the study clear? Are the results relevant? Is the study novel? And then is the methodology sound? The presentation is of good quality. That is also very important, more than you think. Then if you're lucky and your paper went to peer review, the editors will forward you their comments and will give you about a month to address those comments, depending on the journal and the type of manuscript. And you will submit the revised manuscript afterwards. Getting reports from the reviewers can be sometimes a difficult situation. You are confronted with critical comments and major concerns. So we recommend that you go at it systematically. You should respond point by point to every comment and comply with as many reviewer requests as possible. You don't have to convey all the requests, but you 
have to address them all at least. If you disagree, you will explain the reasons for not compliance politely and logically. Keep your reply short and to the point. And remember to revise your manuscript carefully in light of the reviewer's comments, because when they did not understand something, the chances are that your readers won't either. Remember that the reviewer's comments will help your manuscript to improve and be stronger and try to get it as a boost to improve your paper. Be precise mentioning the changes. This is, uh, this is something that will save time for the editors and the reviewers and we greatly appreciate it. You should submit a track changes document and also a clean document and mention the line number where those changes were made in the main text. So the response should not only be this has been addressed, but, but this has been addressed in this line, and then you would paste the paragraph that you have, um, where you have addressed th that comment. Now we are gonna briefly talk about publication ethics. There are ethical standards for publication, and they exist to ensure high quality scientific publications, public trust, in scientific findings and that people receive credit for their ideas. It is important to be transparent for the authors, for the reviewers, and for the editors. Same <clears throat> issues from the author's perspective that they need to avoid could be carelessness, for example, citation bias, as we said before, understatement, negligence, or faulty analysis. Plagiarism, we also discussed about this, and disclosed sources, copying of text without references. Redundancy, like salami publications. This means publishing many very similar manuscripts based on the same experiment, or even the same results with minor changes. This can make the readers less likely to pay attention to your manuscripts. Unfair authorship, like failure to include eligible authors or including honorary authors that didn't really contribute to your manuscript. And declared competing interest, personal, professional, or financial. And very importantly, subject violations, human and animal, meaning submitting a manuscript with no ethical review board approval for the study. This would be rejected immediately. And then fraud, of course, fabrication of data or falsification. So this is what we wanted to cover today. Thank you for attending the webinar. We will now show you some useful resources and then go through the questions. Please remember to fill the poll after you leave the webinar because it will greatly help us to improve our presentation.